In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. A couple of day, days ago, we celebrated the wonderful feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Before we examine the significance of this Marian feast, we will begin with an Ave Maria for Heavenly Assistance. Ave Maria, gracia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu rebus, et benedictus fructus ventris tu Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora por mi spectoribus, nunc in hora mortis nostre. Amen. In one of his Marian sermons, St. Bernardine of Siena said the following, What mortal man, unless he were protected by divine pronouncement, would presume with his uncircumcised, his impure lips, to speak briefly or at length about the true mother of God, about her whom God the Father predestined before all ages to be a perpetual virgin, whom the Son chose for his most worthy mother, whom the Holy Ghost prepared as the dwelling place of every grace. With what words can a mere man like myself say anything of the lofty thoughts of that virgin's heart uttered by her most holy lips, thoughts for which the tongues of all the angels would not be adequate. For the Lord said, the good man from the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good. And this word also can be a treasure. Among those who are merely human, who can be thought of as better than she? who merited it to be made mother of God, who for, who for nine months gave the hospitality of her heart and of her womb to God himself. What treasure could be better than that divine love with which the heart of the Virgin burned like a fiery furnace? And so, from this heart, as from a furnace of divine ardor, the Blessed Virgin Mary brought forth good words, that is, the words of the most ardent love. For as from a vessel full of the best wine, only the best wine can be poured, or as from a very hot furnace, nothing can come forth that is not burning hot, so indeed from the Mother of Christ, could come no word except one of the highest and greatest divine love and ardor. And as the words of a wise lady are few, but substantial and full of meaning, so it is that seven times, approximately seven words, are read as having been spoken by the Blessed Mother of Christ a mystic way of showing that she was indeed full of the sevenfold grace. To the angel, she spoke twice only, and twice only to Elizabeth. And she spoke twice to her son, once in a temple and once at the marriage feast. And she spoke once to the servants of that marriage. On all these occasions, she spoke very, very little, though she spoke at greater length in praise of God and in thanksgiving, that is when she said, my soul doth magnify the Lord. And here she spoke not with men, but with God. These seven words were spoken in a wonderful gradation and order, according to the seven progressions and acts of love. They are like seven flames from the furnace of her heart. In addition, St. Robert Bellman, in one of his homilies concerning the Gospel of St. John, read on the Feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, he said the following. The burden and the yoke imposed by the Lord on St. John to care for his virgin mother was a sweet yoke and a light burden indeed. For who would not be most willing to dwell with that mother 
who carry, carried the word incarnate in her womb for nine months and lived with him for 30 years of most tender devotion. Who would not envy the beloved of the Lord, who in the absence of the Son of God had the presence of the Mother of God? But, if I am not mistaken, by our prayers, we can obtain the same favor from the Word, from the Word who became incarnate for our sake and in his great love was crucified for our sake. In his kindness, he will say to us also, Behold thy mother. And concerning each one of us, he will say to his mother, Behold thy son. The kind Lord is not miser miser miserly or stingy with his graces. If only we approach the throne of his grace with faith and trust and with a heart, not superficial, but true and sincere. He who wished us to be co heirs of his Father's kingdom will certainly not disdain to have us as co heirs of his mother's love. Nor will that most kind virgin be oppressed by the great number of, of children, since she has a heart open wide to all, and she desires greatly that none should perish of those whom her son redeemed with his most precious blood and by his most precious death. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of the grace of Christ and ask him humbly and with tears that each one of us, that of, of each one of us, he may say to his mother, behold thy son. And to each one of us, he may say of, of his mother, behold thy mother. How good it will be for us to be under the protection of such a mother. Who would dare to snatch us away from her loving care? What temptation can overcome us if we trust in the protection of the mother God and our mother? Nor will we be the first to receive this benefit. Many have preceded us. Many have sought the unique and truly mother, motherly protection of the great virgin. And no one has been sent away ashamed or sad, but all are happy and joyful, confiding in the protection of so great a mother. For it is written of her, she shall crush thy head. Hence those who trust in her are confident that they will tread upon the asp and the viper and will trample down the lion and the dragon. For it does not seem possible that anyone who could perish about whom Christ says to the virgin, Behold thy son. If he himself is not deaf to what Christ says to him, Behold thy mother. Such are the words of St. Robert Bellarmine. And indeed, this most holy mother of God will come down from heaven and crush the head of the serpent, destroying all the modernism and heresies, novelties, infecting the church, especially Vatican II and its evil fruits, the Noah's Order Mass, the new catechisms, the new Bibles, the new code of canon law, the new Lumus Rosary Mysteries, and so on. As well as all, as well as all the wickedness in the world today, bringing about the what marvelous triumph of her immaculate heart, as she promised over a hundred years ago at Fatima. Indeed, to understand the great need to devotion to the immaculate heart of Mary, one must first of all understand the messages of Fatima. As Father Anthony o. Farrell explains in an overview way, he said the messages of Fatima are very powerful messages 
for each one of us and for the whole world. It was given to three shepherd children who were illiterate. The names were Lucia, Francisco, and Jacinta. Francisco and Jacinta were brother and sister. Lucia was their first cousin. Only God would give these children such an important message for the salvation of souls. Yes, God can do great things even when using very imperfect tools. Prayer and penance are two words that sum up the messages of Fatima. The words of Our Lady of the Rosary that most impressed Lucia were, people must amend their lives, ask pardon for their sins. And another quotation that affected Lucia, do not offend the Lord our God anymore because he is already so much offended. In the world today, many people no longer believe in an afterlife, how wrong they are. Our Lady told the children she was from heaven and she would one day take each of them to heaven. So heaven does exist. During the third apparition, our Blessed Lady showed the children a vision of hell and the demons and the souls of poor sinners, and lost ones. So hell does exist and will continue to exist forever and ever. Have no doubt about that. Our Lady also spoke of purgatory. So Fatima confirms the existence of heaven, hell, and purgatory. But remember, our Blessed Lady also said, if people do what I ask, many souls will be saved and there will be peace on earth. At each of the six apparitions, Our Lady asked the children to pray the rosary every day. And there will be peace in the world, for she alone can help. Yes, the rosary is a most powerful prayer, but unfortunately, very many never pray it. Fatima is an alarm call to all people, young and old, rich and poor, educated and un uneducated, to amend their lives and to ask God's pardon for their sins. We must remember, remember the words of our Blessed Mother when she said, many souls go to hell because there is no one to pray and make sacrifices for them. In a similar tone, Pope Pius XII also wrote the following, a great mystery, this and never sufficiently meditated on that the salvation of many depends on the prayers and sacrifices made for this intention by the members of the mystical body of Christ. That is, the, the salvation of many depends on the prayers and sacrifices of few. Fatima encourages us to respect and follow the teachings of the Holy Catholic Church because the Church is a custodian of the true law of God and the doctrine taught by Jesus Christ. Pope Pius XII wrote the following, the time for doubting Fatima is over. Now is the time for action. How many Catholic faithful or Catholic clergy actually live this message today? The devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary taught at Fatima can be taken up in two parts. First is reparation and the second is consecration. The first, communion of reparation and devotion of the first five Saturdays is extremely important to understand. On December 10th, 1925, <clears throat> Our Blessed Lady appeared to Sister Lucia while she was praying in the chapel on the con of the convent in Ponte Vedra. At the most holy virgin side was the child Jesus, and who spoke first and said, Have compassion on the heart of thy most holy mother, covered with thorns, 
with which ungrateful men pierce it at every moment. And there is no one to make an act of reparation to remove them. Our Lady then held out her thorn-wreathed heart and said, Look, my daughter, at my heart, surrounded with thorns with which ungrateful men pierce me at every moment by their blasphemies and ingratitude. Thou at least try to console me and say that I promise to assist at the hour of death with the graces necessary for salvation all those who on the first Saturday of five consecutive months shall confess, receive Holy Communion, receive, recite five decades of the Rosary, and keep me company for 15 minutes while meditating on, on the 15 mysteries of the Rosary. All this with the intention of making reparation to me. Now the Saturday devotion in honor of the Most Holy Virgin Mother of God and to her Immaculate Heart was practiced long before the apparition of December 10th, 1925. It has its roots in the early history of the Church. Many Christian writers such as St. Ephraim, St. Anselm, and St. Peter Canisius, St. John Eudes, St. Bernard Clairvaux, St. Francis de Sales, and others had written on devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. One of the chief reasons for an increase of devotion of the, to the first five, the, fir, the five first Saturdays is due to the promise given to Sister Lucia by our Blessed Lady that at the hour of death she would assist with all the graces necessary for salvation all the souls who practice this devotion with the intention of making reparation to her. This intention of making reparation to her Immaculate Heart was specifically requested by Our Lady and is a deeper motive for all to practice this heaven, heavenly sent devotion. As Father Fornasari explains, it is indeed the devotion for today. Our time, so full of errors, tormented by wars and by cruel miseries, will find its salvation in the, immac in the immac Immaculate Heart of Mary. It is a mother's heart. It knows how to understand and to forgive. By heavenly wisdom and by sorrowful experience, that heart which felt so much pain knows how to console our grief. It is the first time in the history of apparitions that the Most Holy Virgin invites us to meditation. The Good Mother knows, that, knows the characteristic of our times, that is, the lack of reflection on everything that speaks with respect to God and the mania for exterior action. And thus the Most Holy Virgin wants to lead us to the meditation of the Gospel, of the mysteries of the Rosary, the drama of the Incarnation, and each mystery should be an echo of, the, of a divine imitation, a ray of light which casts itself on the ocean of truth. Yes, through the Rosary, the Virgin wishes to lead us to Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Therefore, she calls us to keep her, to keep her faithful company. In addition, as a mother, she knows what is best for her children. Early asks us to receive the sacraments, to pray the rosary, and to meditate, all with the specific intention of making reparation to her immaculate heart. Reparation means to make peace, to make peace for our sins and for the sins of society. In this age of virtual communication, meditation on the mysteries of the rosary, the life mysteries of our Lord and Our Lady leads us more and more into a loving conversation with them and consequently into true conversation with other people. What about penance and sacrifice? Having had a vision of hell, Jacinta was continually making sacrifices in order to save souls from hell and frequently said, if people only knew what awaits them in the next life, they would do all in their power to amend their lives. 
Nonetheless, those two words, penance and sacrifice, frighten us. It is true that God sometimes asks, asks a big sacrifice from us. However, the majority of us are only asked to make sac such sacrifices occasionally. But all of us are asked to make small sacrifices every day, and often we miss the opportunity to do so. The angel told the children, make, make of everything you can a sacrifice. Besides the small mortifications of the body we can make, we can also offer up each day the sacrifices necessary to lead a good Christian life and to avoid sin. For example, not making that uncharitable remark, being patient in times of advers adversity, being pure and humble, honest and truthful, being very faithful to our religious obligations and prayers. All these tasks will demand sacrifices each day. Add to these all the unexpected things that happen each day and inconvenience us, and we will be amazed at the number of little sacrifices that the Lord asks of us each day. For example, that heavy rain shower that causes us to change our, change our plans, the power, power outage that came without warning, the long queue in the bank or post office, the bus that is late, the ingratitude of someone, that terrible migraine, and so on. We could go on and on, but hopefully we can see all the golden opportunities we get each day to do something for the Lord so often that all we do instead is complain and lose graces. From now on, let us just say on all these occasions, as was taught to children of Fatima, O oh my Jesus, it is for love of thee, for the conversion of sinners, and especially in reparation for the sins committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Let's also remember our Blessed Lady's words, many souls go to hell because there is no one to pray and make sacrifices for them. Later, when Lucia was at the convent of Tui, her confessor father, Jose Bernardo Concalves, wrote Lucia asking her to explain the reason for five first Saturdays of devotion. Why not nine or fifteen, as these devotions already existed? After completing a holy hour in front of the Blessed Sacrament one Thursday evening, Lucia wrote him back the following. When I was in a chapel with our Lord, part of the night of May 29th to 30th, the year 1930, and I spoke to our Lord about the questions 4 and 5, I suddenly felt myself more in intimately possessed by the Divine Presence. And if I, am not, I'm, if I am not mistaken, this is what was revealed to me. My daughter, the reason for the five first Saturdays is simple. There are five types of offenses and blasphemies committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. The first one, blasphemies against the Immaculate Conception. Secondly, blasphemies against her perpetual virginity. Thirdly, blasphemies against her divine maternity in refusing at the same time to recognize her as the mother of men. Fourthly, the blasphemies of those who publicly seek to sow in the hearts of children indifference or scorn or even hatred of the Immaculate Mother. And the fifth one, the offenses of those who outrage her directly in her holy images. Here my daughter is the reason why the Immaculate Heart of Mary inspired me to ask for this little act of reparation and in consideration of it to move my mercy to pardon souls who have had the misfortune of offending her. As for you, 
always seek by your prayers and sacrifices to move my mercy to pity for these poor souls. And Father Joachim Alonso, the official archivist of Fatima for over 16 years until his death in 1981, provided a fascinating commentary on the, uh, on the above five reasons for the five first Saturdays and how they directly relate to the present moment in the world and in the church. The first blasphemy against the conception, he said, Father, Father Alonso asks, who are those who might commit this offense against the Immaculate Heart of Mary? He answers, in the first place, and in general, the Protestant sects who refuse to receive the dogma defined by Pope Pius IX and have continued to maintain that the Blessed Virgin was conceived with the stain of original sin and even personal sins. The same can be said of the dissident Eastern Christians since in spite of their great Marian devotion, they too refuse this dogma. The second blasphemy, although the Orthodox accept it, the majority of Protestants also reject the perfect and perpetual virginity of Mary before, during, and after giving birth. The third blasphemy, although Protestants theoretically accept the divine maternity of Mary, defined at the Council of Ephesus, they refuse to recognize her as the mother of men in the Catholic sense, which implies her, to, which implies her co-redemption and her role as mediatrix of all graces. The fourth blasphemy concerns the perversion of children by enemies of Our Lady, whereby they strive to inculcate indifference, scorn, or even hatred for the Immaculate Virgin, and the fifth one, by which they outrage her in her holy images. These last two sins are the logical consequence of the first three, and often go together with them. Scorn for the Immaculate Virgin and a disrespect of her holy images, born from Protestantism, is passed on to the children of those in these false religions. Tragically, today, this ignorance and coldness does not apply to non-Catholics only. Since the time of Vatican II, all too many Catholics, including a frightening number of clergy and religious, have disregarded these great Marian tru truths reiterated by Almighty God Himself. Furthermore, Sister Lucia has, has many times emphasized the great need for reparation and her latest request to repair for the countless blasphemies of ungrateful men whose sins are thorns piercing her immaculate heart. When we consider all of this and the great promise of salvation to those who fulfill the same conditions, the simple conditions, we will certainly resolve to fervently practice this devotion of the five first Saturdays, not only once, but regularly throughout our lives. What about those true Catholics who have to wait seven or eight weeks for a priest and the sacraments, since one must never compromise the true Catholic faith with any priest who accepts Vatican II and his evil fruits, the Noah's Order Mass, the New Catechisms, and so on? Every effort to do the first Saturday devo devotion will console the climatic heart of Mary in some way. One good recommendation in our situation is to do a good act of contrition and a spiritual communion when no priest is available on the first Saturday of the month. The second part of the devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary concerns consecration, the consecration of Russia. To understand the, this part of devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, we should go back to July 13, 1917. On July 13, 1917, at Fatima, on the same day Our Lady had given the children the vision of hell, Our Lady promised to return to ask for the consecration of Russia. 
True to her word, the Virgin appeared again to Lucia on June, June 13th, 1929 in Tui, Spain. Lucia, now Dorothean nun, named Sister Lucia, she would not become a Carmelite until 1948, was praying in the convent chapel during the first hour of adoration and reparation. During the holy hour of reparation and adoration. The request for the consecration of Russia was accompanied by the, a most unique vision of the Blessed Trinity. This is how Luc Sister Lucia describes it. I had requested and obtained permission from my superiors and confessor to make the holy hour from 11 p.m. until midnight, from Thursday to Friday. Being alone one night, I knelt down before the communion rail in the middle of the chapel to say the prayers of the angel, lying prostrate. Feeling tired, I got up and knelt and continued to say them with my arms in the form of a cross. The only light came from the sanctuary lamp. Suddenly, a supernatural light illumined the whole chapel, and on the altar appeared a cross of light, which reached to the ceiling. In a brighter part could be seen on the upper part of the cross, the face of a man and his body to the waist. On his breast was an equally luminous dove and nailed to the cross the body of another man. A little below the waist, suspended in midair, was to be seen a, a chalice and a large host upon unto which fell some drops of blood from the face of the crucified and from a wound on his breast. These drops ran down over the host and fell into the chalice. Over the right arm of the cross was Our Lady, Our Lady Fatima, with her immaculate heart in her hand. Under the left arm of the cross, some big letters as if it were crystal clear water running down over the altar formed these words, grace and mercy. As with the great miracle of the sun, there is no phenomenon like it ever before recorded. Thus did God himself signify the singular importance of what Our Lady of Fatima was about to tell Sister Lucia in the miraculous presence of the Most Holy Trinity. She said the following to her, The moment has come in which God asks the Holy Father to make in union with all the bishops of the world, the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart, promising to save it by this means. We note that God himself requests this. Sister Lucia received this request from the lips of the Mother of God herself, speaking in God's name, in the presence of the, in the, presence of the very Godhead, the Most Holy Trinity. The immense gravity of this request is certainly beyond our comprehension. Sister Lucia immediately conveyed the divine request to her confessor, Father Jose Bernardo Concalves, as reflected in her correspondence with him. Throughout her life, Sister Lucia remained steadfast. Our Lady did not ask for the Pope to consecrate the world, but rather Russia. And on May 18, 1936, Sister Lucia wrote to her confessor, Father Concalves, in response to his question, should I insist, should I still insist on the consecration of Russia? She replied, should you insist? I do not know. Recently, I was speaking with our Lord and asked him why he would not convert Russia without the Pope doing that consecration. Jesus replied, because I want my whole church to recognize that consecration as a triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary so that later on it will be, it will be put, so that later on it will put the devotion to the Immaculate Heart beside devotion to the Sacred Heart, to my Sacred Heart.
Let us remember that to consecrate means to dedicate, to set aside a person or persons, place or thing for a holy purpose. The consecration of Russia means that Russia, the nation and the country of Russia, is distinguished, is set aside from the rest of the world and dedicated to the service of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Thus, it is clear that the consecration of Russia needs to specify to distinguish Russia from the rest of the world. In brief, the consecration of Russia needs to name Russia in the consecration prayer. This is, is an undeniable fact. And St. Thomas Aquinas says, against a fact, there is no argument. Besides all this, we also have the testimony of Sister Lucia herself. The decisive, the decisive character, which is, a, is, which is the stamp of the proper consecration, is the miraculous conversion of Russia. Today it must be emphasized, since many have been confused on this issue by false ecumenism, that the conversion of Russia means conversion to Catholicism. This is not only a point of common sense, but it is also found in the testimony of Father Joachim Alonso, probably the top Fatima expert in, of the 20th century. Father Alonso, Alonso, who had many interviews with Sister Lucia, said the following, We should affirm that Lucia always thought that the conversion of Russia is not limited to return of the Russian people to the Orthodox Christian religion, rejecting the Marxist atheism of the Soviets, but rather it, pref it refers purely, plainly, and simply to the total integral conversion of Russia to the one true Church of Christ, the Holy Catholic Church. Now the problem today is that most Catholics believe that what Rome says, namely that the 1984 consecration was done properly. However, this is not true. Much testimony could be given on this point, the most powerful being the fact that the world has not been blessed with peace even after the 1984 consecration of the world. We have seen wars in Kosovo, Somalia, El Salvador, the attack of the Twin Towers in the United States, the wars in Iraq and Af Afghanistan, the war between Russia and Georgia, which prompt, prompted even secular journalists in the late summer of 2008 to, to admit that the Cold War never ended, and more rumors of wars on the horizon. Neither have we seen any sign of Russia's conversion to the Catholic faith. A land where the largest religion is the schismatic Orthodox, who reject many Catholic truths, including that of the papacy and the Immaculate Conception. The next largest is Islam, followed by a collection of Protestant denominations. Catholicism is still a minority religion in Russia, and are power in numbers with small sects such as Jehovah Witnesses, the Mormons, the Quakers, the Herr Krishnas, the Moonies, the Unification Church, and the Church of Scientology. Moreover, immorality is rampant, is rampant in Russia, including a divorce rate that equals that of the United States. 1998, 14 years after 1984 consecration of the world, the Federal Research Division of the Library of Congress stated that Russia had had the highest abortion rate in the world, 3.5 million abortions in Russia every year. Thus, it is impossible to agree with those who claim any further discussion or request for the consecration of Russia is without basis. Pray a great deal for the Holy Father. Jesus told Sister Lucia, he will do it, but it will be late. How late it will be? 
and whether the terrible consequences of the annihilation of na nations can be avoided depends on our prayers and sacrifices. And it depends on the men whom our Lord referred to as my ministers. It is they, the Pope and the bishops of the Catholic Church, who have the power and the duty to heed Our Lady's requests to consecrate Russia and thus avoid the annihilation of various nations as a punishment for man's sins, which is one of the last unfulfilled warnings of the Fatima prophecy. Indeed, when enough people follow the message of Fatima, then the Holy Father and the bishops of, throughout the world will be given the grace to do the consecration of Russia properly. Sorrowful Immaculate Mary, pray for us and save us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.